In this video, I'm going to give you my take on agent frameworks. I'm going to tell you why I think they will fail and what to use instead. If you don't know who I am, my name is Dave Ebelaar. I'm the founder of Data Lumina, and I've been building custom data and AI solutions for the past five years. And next to that, I create educational content like this to help you do the same and ultimately start freelancing. So let's dive into this video. So with the rise of large language models, so-called agentic workflows and frameworks became really popular. And as a result, we saw a lot of them pop up. So for example, we have Autogen, we have Crew AI, and also Langchain has a way to build agents, and you have a lot more. And the problem with all of, the, all of those frameworks is that most of them are probably way too complex for what you're trying to do and not robust enough for what you're trying to do. So let me explain. All of these tools and all of these frameworks are really, most of them are built around the core idea of chaining agents together in a way where they can reason and figure out the next step within some kind of workflow. So here, if you look at the definition by Langchain, the core idea of an agent is to use a language model, so an LM, to choose a sequence uh, of actions to take in a chain. So a language model is used as a reasoning engine to determine which action to take. Crew AI follows a similar approach where you can very easily design agents, you can give them tasks, and I believe there's also this allow delegation parameter that you can fill in. So agents have backstories, roles, goals, and depending on the overall system, they can decide the next path to take. And the result of that is really cool and creative in a way that every time you run this you can get different outcomes you can get new stories you can build really cool processes for this but the problem what i found is that most of the processes in the real world right now that you want to automate for a business for example does not require that much room for creativity actually mostly it's the other way around you want to take a process that is very clearly defined and if it's not defined you want to you want to define that and then figure out the sequence of steps the sequence of actions to automate that workflow and then whenever you need ai to solve a particular step within that chain of problems that is where a large language model comes in so let's take a look at this example so i've been building apps using large language models literally since the day uh, gpt 3.5 came out and in general if you look at the app flow of all of these applications it follows this process you have inputs in the form of your data your prompts then there is a processing layer which can be one simple processing step one llm call or it could be a chain of events multiple llm calls intermediate function processing steps external api calls whatever there could be a lot of processing and finally there's always some sort of output because when you're using generative ai these models create something they create output and typically you want to store that either in a database make it available to a front end in a chat application or whatever input processing output that is how these projects are set up now if you look at the agentic framework flow of how agentic frameworks are trying to solve this problem it looks something like this and this is a very simplified version but really what's going on they take that input and then that processing layer that is where all of the agent comes in and typically there is some kind of a manager or orchestrator in between that can interact with all of these agents who all have specific goals backstories and tasks so let's come back to crew over here here you can see initiate the crew so you have the crew the agents and the tasks so that is what i would refer to as the manager that is where you br would bring everything together but when we look at all of these agents and the manager as a whole all of this is typically connected well it doesn't have to be the case you could also make it sequential but in general this is the agent work framework philosophy where there you have a lot of agents working together so agent one might do something pass it on to agent two but then agent three might need something from agent one etc and if agent three th thinks the output is not good enough we go back to agent one and eventually if everyone agrees we pass it on to the manager and then we have the output so that would that would the result in the flow that you you see over here and autogen and building agents with langchain 
all follow similar processes. And the problem with that, how I see it, is we are literally collectively all trying to figure out the best way to build applications around language models, large language models. We're trying to figure out the best workflows. We're trying to figure out how to do this at scale, how to manage hallucinations. And all of these tools, they have their own opinionated way of going about it. And don't get me wrong, I don't want to bash these tools. They're great for certain use cases. I just want to point out that I believe for most of the automation use cases for businesses right now, I wouldn't recommend using these tools. Because like I've said, you're building on top of abstractions that other developers came up with in a new field, which we are all still trying to figure out. And because you're building on top of these extractions like this, you probably don't know what's going on behind the scenes because that's really hard to understand if you dive into a new bloated library that you didn't write yourself. So what I recommend instead is keeping things really simple and building these applications up really from the ground, really from first principles. So really consider for your situation, for your application, what it is that you, what is it that you need and what are the steps required in order to solve this problem and if we go back to the whiteboard the way i currently do that which i will show you an example in a bit is i view the generative ai app flow not as an agentic problem to solve but rather i look at it as a data pipeline because if you look at the general flow flow input processing output it's very similar to a regular ETL pipeline, extract, transform, load. And the cool thing about data pipelines is they have literally been around for years. Ever since we had computers, people have built data pipelines. And there are a lot more solid principles and design patterns and approaches that we can leverage when we follow a data pipeline flow rather than an agentic workflow. And also, rather than designing your workflow using circular patterns where, for example, agent three can jump back to agent one, to two, and then back to one, you ideally, at least how I like to do it, is I design my pipelines using a sequential approach. So following a what's known as a directed acyclic graph or DAC, which is also what tools like Airflow are uh, built on top of on, on that design principle, meaning that data can only flow one way and not go back. And this overall ensures the reliability of your system, because in my opinion, you should really design your workflows in a way that if the pipeline, if the flow ends up at three, it should already have processed one and two, the outputs, so that you can always continue with three. And it's just about how you, how you frame the problem. And that's why the sequential order really helps for that. So you always know it's first this step, then this step, and in between you can add all kinds of logic and validation. But if your business process or automation process, if you can't draw it out like this using simple sequential steps, I recommend you to go back to the whiteboard and try to make it simpler or split it up even further because almost every process for, for most business problems that you're trying to solve, they can be broken down like this. And now the cool thing about viewing the problem that you're trying to solve with an LLM as a data pipeline rather than an agentic framework or workflow is that it becomes much simpler to solve this using code without needing any fancy frameworks or tools. So let me quickly show you an example. So I'm going to show you an example in Python, but again, the cool thing is you can do this in any language because it doesn't matter. If you follow the similar steps of getting your data, chaining together steps in a data pipeline, bringing it all together, and then pushing it to whatever kind of output you're pushing it to. It doesn't matter what language you use and you don't need any framework. So let me show you an example. This is a project template that I'm building out. So it's called Generative AI Project Template. It's pretty complex. There are a lot of moving parts and we're building this internally for our company, but I'm going to show you the pipeline process in there, because that's what, what we're talking about right now. So we're currently using the example of creating a system that can take an incoming email, then classify it, and then generate a reply. So this could be 
what you call an agent workflow or a problem that you can solve using a large language model. Now, the cool thing about designing these pipelines and these solutions for these problems is that you can have one step or you could have 100 steps. It doesn't matter. And ideally in your code, you want to build it in such a way that you can easily add steps and remove steps and change steps. Now, a very common design pattern to do this is the chain of responsibility pattern. So I've used that particular pattern. I will show you in a bit what that looks like and give it my own spin to it by including some pipeline elements into it. And now being able to very easily define sequential steps. And then in between, when it's time to call the large language model, we do that. So let's see what's going on over here. We're simulating an incoming ticket here from a ticketing system. So let me zoom in a little bit. So let's assume we're, we're getting in some data and the ticketing system identifies, okay, this is from an email. This is from uh, info at datalumina.com. And it's an email asking for a potential collaboration. Now, the sender here is Data Lumina reaching out to me, so that would be a little bit weird, but you get the idea. We're getting some input data here. And throughout this project, um, we have identified some pipelines. And for this ticketing system, we are going to define in f at first two pipelines, just for example. So we have tickets coming in from email and we have tickets coming in from Instagram. So what you, how you could then view that is you have your data pipeline and you have another one for Instagram. So this could be email, this could be Instagram. And again, you could infinitely duplicate this to expand your system. So the whole idea with this project really is that everything has a nice and tidy place for it. So we have our pipelines. So let's see at what that then looks like if we come in here and we process the task. So we take that data, we're using Pydentic models and we call process the tasks. We then call a pipeline registry, which is using a registry design pattern. Again, a design pattern that is solid, that is proven. And what this does is depending on whether the channel is email or Instagram, we get the right pipeline. So again, through that frame, we have different pipelines, data comes in, system figures out, okay, we need this pipeline. So we can route uh, different requests to the right place. Okay, let's go one step further and look at what a pipeline actually is. So let's consider the email pipeline. The email pipeline is a sequence of steps. First, we have classify email and then we have generate response. So in this case, we're only using two steps. But like I've said, you can make this infinitely complex by simply adding more steps to the system. And this is where the chain of responsibility pattern comes in. So let me come back to the registry. Let's look at the email pipeline and look at the base pipeline. So the base pipeline step is configured with a run function where it loops over all of the steps in the pipeline and then calls the step.process which processes all of the data. And you can see there is an abstract method in here called process, and it's just used to pass around the data between the different steps. Now, I'm covering this high level. If you wanna know more about this, let me know in the comments. Um, you could research these design patterns on your own. Really, the idea is not here to really get in great detail on how this works, but rather show you how simple it can be by combining two design patterns and putting that together in a structured way. So following all of that, let's look at the two processing steps that we in have in here. So we have a classify email, which leverages the instructor library. If you don't know what the instructor library is, you can use it to patch large language models and use it to uh, validate your, your output by defining a response model. This is really powerful and will completely change the way you build uh, applications around large language models. I have a video on that as well, which I will link afterwards, but this is really big. Now, what this all allows you to do, let me zoom out a little bit, is having one simple input over here. And if I run this, we can have a look. Uh, we have the function over here and now we can just process this. So let's just process this and see what happens. And now it will just trigger the pipeline. So it will run, it will step one, step two, it will pass down the data and it will fire or it will run the processing steps 
as defined in the classes over here. But now let's look at the cool thing. Let's let's see where is it. Let's look at the cool thing is so first we have the classification. So it says it's a collaboration. It also adds a confidence score because I've asked it to. We can validate it with Pydentic. And we also ask reasoning, which is something I really like to do. So next to just defining an output, you also ask the, the model to give a reasoning. And that is then used in your system via logging or in a database to backtrack something, to debug, to reduce hallucinations. And then over here, we have the response. And it says, thank you for reaching out. We appreciate your interest. However, we're currently not pursuing any collaborations. And that is because there's a prompt folder over here um, where we've created the prompt and we can introduce some guidelines here for the system to consider. Okay, so that's the output, but now let's look at what is happening behind the scenes and what we get back. So the result is now a task result. And instead of a single like text output, we have a dictionary with, if this runs in production, we have a task ID from salary, we have the status, it's completed. We have the input data, which is the original data. We have processing context, which is any context or any, any intermediate steps that you need throughout the system. So let me explain. So for example, in step one, you might calculate or you might determine the category of the email. Then you might save that as an intermediate step and then use that in step two to, for example, get the right data through uh, or the right contacts through a rack system. That is, an, 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 that is how you could use that, for example. So you store any intermediate data, for example, the category in there. And then you also have the output data, which in this case is the response. And we're building this out so that we follow a uh, Pydentic, we follow Pydentic uh, models. Let me actually come in here. And this is still a work in progress where we have a predefined structure for input, processing, output, task results, and the events that come in so that we can use it for all of our generative AI problems. And again, if you want to know more about this, uh, I plan to do a whole video on this, discovering this, but we're still working this out. And also that's not the goal because again, I'm also right now in a sense, creating my own extractions and my own systems. And the goal really is to show you that you probably don't need someone else's framework. Figure out what your problem, what, what your problem needs, how to solve the problem using a simple data pipeline, and then build it up from the ground, from first principles, so that one, you fully understand it and it doesn't become too bloated. And now here to quickly demonstrate that, if we come over here to let's process the Instagram task. So you can see channel is now Instagram, we have a username. Uh, let's see, so we got this and then we process that task and we can look at the results and that is currently uh, coded to, to generate a hard-coded reply, but you can see that it correctly takes on the correct pipeline depending on the incoming user data. And having built tons of generative AI applications, this is typically what you want. You filter the input, you decide what comes in, what kind of data, what kind of user, what kind of platform. You want to follow sequential processing steps and then output it to another system. So that's it for this video. And by the way, if you're a developer and you want to get started with freelancing, but struggle to find clients, you might want to check out the first link in the description. It's a video of me going over how my company can help you solve that problem. And now in all transparency, it's a funnel designed to get leads for my company. So please keep that in mind. You don't have to click it, but if you want to get started with freelancing, but don't know how to get started, go check it out. And now if you found this video helpful, please leave a like and also consider subscribing. And then if you want to learn more about building reliable systems with large language models, for example, using the instructor library, make sure to check out this video next where I go over my entire workflow, really deep diving into how you can set this up for yourself.